Hello, insiders. Today, I have a very special guest. I have Zach from the Try Guys on the Insider Nation. Welcome to the show, Zach. Hey, Tom. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here and chat everything YouTube. Yeah, man. It's cool. It's cool having you here. Before we get into the channel, I would love to start with like life before uh, mm -hmm. becoming a YouTube creator. Like, what were you doing, you know, pre Try Guys? Oh, wow. Pre-try, guys. Who can even remember that part? <laughs> um, so I grew up, you know, when I was growing up, YouTube wasn't a thing yet. You know, the idea of being a YouTuber wasn't even a career aspiration that I could have imagined. I, I think I was a teenager when YouTube had started to, to come to uh, the forefront. But I grew up loving movies. I, I mm -hmm. always had a passion for filmmaking. I was making little movies with my teddy bears in my bedroom and always knew that I wanted to come out to LA to try and be a writer director. Uh, in the years when I first moved out here, I was working the commercial production circuit. So working as a PA and then working myself up in the coordinator route. So it was a lot of really wonderful experience witnessing some of the greatest directors of the modern era, you know, front row seat to watch them work. Mm. But I was frustrated. I was doing that for about two years and I had only gotten a chance to make a couple things on my own. And the stuff that I was making on my own, I hated. It was this, uh, I'm sure I'll come back to this idea throughout this talk, but Ira Glass has this great talk about the gap. And it's when you're starting out as a young creative person, there's a gap between your taste, which is impeccable, and your abilities, which <laughs> typically is not that. And right. that creates a lot of frustration because you go, ah, I, I know what I want to make. I, I have these great ideas, but I can't do it. And frankly, it wasn't until I started my career in web video that I then picked up that 10,000 hours of experience and really was able to hone my craft and, and get great at what I do. So how did you go from leaving the film industry to then ending up at BuzzFeed? I uh, made a web series. I can't say it's great. It's my attempt to rip off The Office. It was called The, the Fresh Manager of Jaden Smith. I, I directed this three-part series it didn't do what I had hoped. You know, I thought like, great, I'm going to make this series. Hollywood's going to see it come knocking right. on my door big time. But what did happen is that in trying to make this thing, I reached out to a lot of people. I reached out to my alumni network. I went to Emerson College, which is a great film production school. And a friend of mine, Ella, Ella Milnyshenko, someone I kind of knew of in college, but we never crossed paths. She jumped on uh, to help me produce. And she was the very first intern at BuzzFeed's video program. She's saying like, Zach, come work at BuzzFeed. Zach, come work with me. I'm like, I don't want to. <laughs> I, I did not know BuzzFeed at the time, except for, you know, as the cat gif site. <laughs> I didn't have a high opinion of it. I was, I was mm -hmm. a pretentious film school student who uh, was jaded and didn't want to accept pop culture into my heart. I went there for three months thinking that I would just get some experience under my belt, learn about this new wild world of web video, uh, maybe boost my reel and then move on. Mm -hmm. uh, within the first week, I was like, whoa, this is cool. Something special is happening here and I wanna stay in this field for a long time. Wow, did you, did you feel like you learned more uh, at BuzzFeed than working with these like big time Hollywood studios? Oh, absolutely. I, I learned, frankly, I learned more in, in two years at BuzzFeed than I learned in four years at film school. <laughs> I, oh, wow. <laughs> it, it, it really yeah. felt like my grad school. Do you remember like a experiment you ran or like a new concept that you, you started there that, that really exceeded your expectations that you still look back on and you're like, wow, that was, that was pretty good. I learned a lot on that thing and it, it really did way better than I thought it would do. I mean, frankly, yeah, the Try Guys. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect segue. So, uh, so the Try Guys was birthed at BuzzFeed. Yeah. Then how does that work? Doesn't BuzzFeed like was that a how? Why doesn't it? Why didn't it stay at BuzzFeed? And how did that transition happen? Yeah, sure. So we around. Uh, so the four of us, uh, Keith, Ned, Eugene, and myself, we all started within about a month of each other. And we had been working there for eight months, really just trying to crack viral formats. Uh, eight months in, we made the first video that would become the Try Guys. It wasn't a series. It was just another in a long line of tests. And uh, Keith and I made that video together. We 
we cast ourselves and, and thought like, hey, this could be a fun group dynamic for this thing. It really took on a life of its own. There were some times where some of our higher ups were like, hey, maybe let's not have four producers working on one project. And we're like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and then we just stayed late and did it anyway. It, it really was uh, a passion project. I, I think a lot of people assume that we were cast or that it was some brainchild of an executive being like, oh, we need a four guys who will be willing to do anything. No, it, we just had a lot of fun doing it and the audience loved it. I, I like to say that we came up in the world's fastest and largest focus group. We didn't decide that we were a thing, the audience did. After about four years, I, look, I, I have nothing but good things to say about my time there, but I knew as a creative person and just as a human in general, I needed to leave to grow. So we all made the decision to leave. Um, our contracts had expired. And after uh, a very friendly negotiation, we were able to purchase the IP from BuzzFeed. And they were gracious in, in letting us, even giving us the opportunity to buy it mm -hmm. from them. We launched a new channel. And uh, yeah, we're going a little over two years now, and it's going really well. Yeah, no doubt. So you're negotiating with BuzzFeed, trying to get the IP, trying to get the name. I'm guessing while you're doing that, are you starting to put together your backlog of video ideas and produce stuff? Or are you thinking, let's get this legal stuff sorted out before we can really work on it? No, I mean, we, we basically started filming, I think our final day at BuzzFeed was a Tuesday and we started filming videos on a Thursday. Um, oh, wow. Week. So we just, we just hit the ground running. We like to do formats over just videos or vlogs. That's just what we like to make and what performs better for us. So we needed uh, some runway. We mm -hmm. made sure that we had uh, done block shooting so that we had, I think, a month and a half to two months worth of releases before mm -hmm. we were ready to go live. And that's just because our videos take longer um, than I would say the average YouTube video. Um, on average, I think we're putting eight days of editing into each video. Um, and that's really to ensure that they feel like these fully realized stories with a beginning, middle, and end, three-act structure, a setup and payoff, character arcs, weaving the footage and the expert interviews in interesting ways. So that's just how we like to do things. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because sometimes you'll talk to people who um, they'll say, oh, well, you work at YouTube. Like those creators, they just turn on their camera and all of a sudden they're millionaires. And I try and tell them like, well, the ones that do really well, they take it super seriously and they'll spend, you know, weeks on a video sometimes. Uh, tell me about that first upload. It was just the most thrilling thing. You know, what was really interesting is that uh, because of the strength, frankly, of your algorithm, we were able to, to get back to our view threshold pretty quickly. You know, we did a very intense social blasting mm -hmm. strategy, but basically our videos were being engaged with on our new channel, more or less the same way they had been on BuzzFeed's channel. So the algorithm was feeding it to people. It was it was mm -hmm. saying, hey, you like watching Try Guys videos, you might like watching this new thing that to us seems a lot like the Try Guys video, because it was us. Um, but for the first couple months, you know, we had our first wave of subscribers and then we really plateaued. And it was like, mm. we're getting all these views, but people aren't subscribing. And it became clear to us that because of the way the algorithm worked, people didn't even realize that it was a new channel. They were just like, mm. oh, cool, new video. No one knew that we had left. Um, so it wasn't until we made an explicit, uh, I think about a couple months in, we made, we made a video that explicitly stated, hey, this is a new company, this is a new channel. And we saw, I think, over a million subscribers in a day. Did you have to change it up significantly from the BuzzFeed days? Or is your channel something where you're, I guess, you're? are you always trying new formats, like what's the the cycle of, of kind of the creative process? We knew uh, two things. Making a new channel, we would have to radically up our input. We, we used to be one video every two weeks. On our channel, we're two videos a week, now three videos a week throughout uh, mm -hmm. this quarantine. So we wanted to have more videos than ever before because we know that that's necessary for the health of the algorithm. But we also wanted to have as good a quality, if not better, than we, when we were under a large corporation. So we really challenged ourselves to make something very high quality. So let's talk a little bit about, uh, you must have Emerson alumni and friends say like, hey, Zach, I love what you're doing. I want to do it too. You know, what's the secret? How do you succeed on YouTube? What, what advice do you give people when they're 
they're starting out and they want to they want to you know kind of follow in your footsteps there are certain things i can tell people about what does and doesn't work and how to optimize their content but ultimately you learn through doing and just getting in there getting your hands dirty uh, making a lot of content yeah you have to learn trial trial by fire could you give an example of something you've seen another youtube creator do or through your work with them that you're like ah you know that's a really cool approach we should we should think about you know something like that or rethink some assumptions we have oh absolutely yeah i mean good mythical morning they i want to say they film out a month's worth of videos in four days maybe in a week and then that's yeah. that's their i don't know if i'm outing like their company secret but they they block shoot it they are so efficient with how they film meanwhile we you know sometimes <laughs> we'll take two days on one video uh we'll we'll do 10 20 minutes for pre thoughts where i'm trying to find the perfect joke and we only use 30 seconds of that footage from all four of us like we are wildly inefficient um and so some of that we want to keep because that's the process of discovery and we think that our videos are are great from it but seeing how they worked we were like okay we need to figure out a block shooting system and have like it it, it led to um in part, we do these game time videos where it's us hanging out on onesies. It's a little more relaxed. And it's because we realized, okay, we can shoot two or three of these in a day. They're really fun for the audience. And then we can have those concentrated that then allows us to take on these bigger projects. And then on the cadence of our release, we can kind of oscillate between the two different types of videos and have big video, little video, big video, little video. I wanted to um, touch a little bit on your experience using YouTube as a creator in terms of the the tools we offer or you mentioned the algorithm what feedback do you have for for us and you can you can be candid and straightforward like what do you think we're doing well that you'd like us to continue doing as it relates to helping creators and then what do you think you want to see you know you'd like to see us do more of or do a better job at well i have to pay my respects to the algorithm it giveth and it taketh away um, <laughs> We we've had a uh, we've had a mostly really positive experience. I mean, part of it I think is because we began first as as just students of trying to understand how it worked, and that's uh, informed a lot of our creative decisions. Um, something that's been really helpful that you guys rolled out recently. I don't know if everyone has this. Is the Glinda program, which allows us to upload videos prior and mm -hmm. kind of see if anything uh would get demonetized we do some some borderline stuff sometimes we made a dui series we we did stoned driving we got stoned on camera not demonetized we were like what is going on then we did an earwax extraction video and that was deemed as an invasive surgery which i still disagree with i think you guys are wrong about that would, would you say most of your uh concerns or feedback for us is around policy uh and the actual sort of technology and products are are working okay for, for you? Or do you, do you also feel like the products and the tools and the features are not working as well as they, they could? I've had a pretty good experience with the features and tools. Look, I know that there's a team of really passionate people who are working really hard over there to, to frankly make the experience as good for creators as possible because what's good for us is good for you guys. And there is a symbiotic relationship there. Everyone that I've spoken to on the team really cares passionately about what they're doing and is trying to make it better. I think the 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 things that uh, that I wonder about and and that I hope for the the future of the platform is just that you guys and not you specifically, Tom, but as a company, you guys have a tremendous responsibility, and I think it's a responsibility of precedent that, frankly technology is advancing faster than society and government can understand and so you guys need to be the ones that really dictate what it, what does it look like to be a responsible company in the modern era what does it look like to decide what voices um get to thrive and not there's the future of deep fakes terrifies me uh the few the the things that have happened with uh children's content i mean i know that you guys have been through it and you are constantly trying to do the right thing but these are tremendous choices with with a lot of responsibility and they're not easy choices they're not black and white so i know that uh 
there's a it's not a position I envy. And I know that the people on the inside are really doing what they can to try and navigate those um, as intelligently and as fairly as they can. But that's that's the challenge for the future, right? Is how do you be an ethical company in the modern world? You know, I can say that I think our leadership and and as a company, I think we're we're taking that responsibility really, really seriously and trying to think, you know, decades out. Yeah. Because to your point, um, you know, what we do does does sort of demonstrate one way of doing it and you know, can be a, a form of precedent for other other stakeholders. I remember when I first joined the company four years ago, you know, even in those uh, in my early days at YouTube, like we kept I kept hearing like responsible growth and responsible policies. And, you know, there's this kind of much longer term vision than uh, than maybe um, is typical uh, for for other other places. So I, I was impressed by that. And uh, I think we're we're, you know, the there's way, when, I hear, when I hear Susan talk, I'm like, wow, this is someone who understands the complexities of the situation and cares. And by the way, there may be some incorrect decisions made between now and the end of time. Mm -hmm. But it's clear to me that it's being made in the interest of doing the right thing. It's hard. These are it's like a Rubik's Cube. It's there's rarely like, oh, well, obviously we should do that because, yeah. you know, there's always like all these other perspectives. Um, last question. If you had to um, either ask uh, YouTube anything, is there anything that you wanted to to kind of hit me up with that I can kind of try and shed some light on? Oh man, I I'm this is gonna haunt me. I'm gonna wake up at like three in the morning and be like, why didn't I ask him? <laughs> you know, something that we've been thinking about lately, and this is actually a, a bugaboo we have, is that we have been told by you guys that one video bombing does not affect the videos thereafter, that the algorithm sees every video as unique. Mm -hmm. And experientially, I can say that's not true. <laughs> we had, you know, our average is about one to 1.2, 1.6 in a day. We had one video that was an experiment of ours and for us bombed, I wanna say it's a four to 600,000 view video. Mm -hmm. And as a result, our next four releases were much below our average and we finally just recovered from that mm. uh, by the way i know the video that did bad i know why it did bad i get that but i think a lot of people are freaked out about stuff like that it, it discourages this sense of experimentation that's a um that's a really good question i would point to a couple of things like i think the inverse you experienced the inverse where you started a new channel and you didn't tell us like, hey, this is uh, from the BuzzFeed guys. And we were able to notice that, wow, this video is doing well. We're going to recommend it more, even though that channel probably didn't have many uploads in its history. Right. And so so at least from there, you know that there is an atomic kind of principle working uh, with recommendations. And we don't sort of, um, you know, require that a video come from a channel that has like this long history. I think for the more recent example, I mean, it do, do you do you not uh, accept the possibility that the subsequent four videos just you know were were not as good as as your typical videos? They may not have been as good. <laughs> it's very possible they were not as good. And and look, I I know that there's a human factor to this too, where maybe they saw people humans saw this video and went, ah, well the last one was kind of a throwaway, so maybe the next ones maybe they're like churning out not good content now. Definitely a possibility. Do you do you guys go into the uh, the the analytics? Did you look at the click through rate and average view duration for the four subsequent ones? I didn't in this case. I have in the past. If if you find that your four subsequent ones, or you know, if someone on your team wants to take a look, and you're like, no, look, Tom, the click through rate and view duration is 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 as high as the the previous ten, and it's just because of this one bomb that you guys you know punished us. I'd love to take a look at that, but but. If you find out that actually the performance numbers were on the weaker side, 
then you can tell then other people to, be yeah. like, hey, you know, it's not all. You know, sometimes it's just the audience doesn't doesn't vibe with the with the video. I don't have to send you like a nice fruit basket or something. There you I go. Get it. Well, Zach, thank you for stopping by the Insider Channel. It was great hearing your story, and thank you for sharing all the advice for other creators out there because. I know there's tons of people who want to learn from your experience and are, are big supporters of what you guys are doing at Try Guys. So keep up the great work and uh, thanks for keeping it real. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And hey, to anyone watching, like, just keep making stuff. That's the best thing that you can do. I, I become a student of thumbnails and titles and, and understand what success looks like. But at the end of the day, you're not going to be satisfied if you're just chasing other people's success. If I had a cup of tea, I would I would toast to you right now. Cheers. Oh shit. All right, I'll find some. Here we go. I got a little hey, chai. Little chai tea, baby. <laughs>